Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. This episode is brought to you by our partners at Windwalk. Windwalk builds digital communities and the technologies necessary to accelerate them through their flagship software, Harbor. Harbor is an end-to-end community software that empowers community and marketing teams to delight users, measure success, and grow across an expanding number of digital channels. Harbor is a foundational technology loved by millions of gamers and integrated into the communities of the largest mobile, PC, and Web3 gaming products on the market. To learn more about this flagship product, simply head to harbor.gg or check out the details in the show notes. And with that, let's dive into the episode. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Aaron Bush, and today's episode is going to be awesome. But before I jump in and introduce our guest, let me provide some quick context. This episode is part one in a three-part series about Savvy Games Group. For those who aren't familiar, Savvy is fully owned by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, which set aside roughly $38 billion to invest and build up its global presence in the video game industry. Now, $38 billion is a lot of money because depending on how you slice it, there really are only four to five video game companies that are larger than $38 billion. So how Savvy goes about deploying capital and building its business will, to some degree, alter the landscape of our entire industry. In fact, with the acquisitions of Scopely, ESL, Faceit, not to mention major investments in companies like Nexon, Nintendo, EA, and more, one could argue that Savvy is already making its presence fully known. And from our point of view, as observers and consultants to the industry, it's absolutely worth trying to understand how this quickly growing group thinks, operates, and views its future. So in this series, we're meeting with the leaders of Savvy's most important operating groups. We're chatting with Javier Ferreira, co-CEO of Scopely, next week. And I'll also be interviewing Brian Ward, Savvy's CEO, after that. So there's a lot to look forward to. But today, we begin this series in the realm of esports. Early last year, it was announced that Savvy was acquiring ESL Gaming a leading esports events company, and face it, a platform for managing superior online PvP play for a collective $1.5 billion, and then merging them together as one operating group. So with all of that preamble said, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Craig Levine and Nick Maisto, co-CEOs of ESL Face It Group, to the podcast. Guys, how are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Well, excited to have you here as well. Let's begin by laying the foundation for those who are less familiar with your business. But before we jump into the business details, let's go ahead um, and start with you. I'm curious, uh, maybe you can spend a couple of minutes describing what your professional journeys were to becoming co-CEOs of ESL Face It. Craig, I'll start with you. <laughs> sure. Uh, so I'm a, a lifelong gamer, grew up uh, loving playing games, started playing uh, competitive Counter-Strike and competitive Quake and games like that in the late 90s. I guess Counter-Strike it had come out. And then in 2001, it actually started the first pro team in North America. Uh, esports back then looked uh, very different to what it is now and what's been, been known, um, but really started my journey as a player, as a team owner. Uh, and then in 2014, joined DSL with the acquisition of some uh, uh, communities and companies that had started in the space. So um, then obviously, since then, uh, continue that journey with the ESL Face It Group together with Nick. That's awesome. And Nick, what, what's your side of the story? So I come from uh, finance, uh, way uh, less uh, exciting and more boring than uh, Craig's story. Uh, worked in investment banking for a few years. Uh, in London, uh, eventually uh, moved to New York for a short time, uh, worked in uh, private equity. And at, cer- at a certain point, I 
had to decide whether to continue in uh, that uh, dark side of uh, uh, of the industry or whether to, uh, as I eventually did, uh, go into gaming. Uh, I started a company called Face It. Uh, that was uh, roughly uh, 11 years ago, 11, 12 years ago, uh, and uh, uh, bootstrapped it, uh, uh, scaled it over time, doing a number of things, and eventually finally managed uh, to uh, go through the ESL phase it merge, and uh, here we are. That's awesome. Um, and congrats on on the bootstrapping success there. Uh, but really um, enjoyed hearing both of your your stories. Um, and really, before we move on, could you just remind everyone of the modern history of how ESL Face It came to be? Because what the entity is now um, really is a result of various different transactions, acquisitions, mergers. Um, could one of you maybe just kind of describe the modern history of how this operating group um, came to its current state? Sure. I think it's uh, uh, extremely interesting how we're uh, a number of companies together. I think you see ESL face it, but uh, it actually goes uh, uh, even beyond that. Um, I think uh, it all started uh, uh, about uh, seven years ago, I'd say. I think that was the first time we started talking about uh, uh, merging the companies or in general finding a way to work together. You had uh, uh, ESL on the events and uh, uh, esports circuit side uh, and esports ecosystem side uh, while facing on the digital side and uh, uh, finding a way to work together made uh, a lot of sense. We've been talking for uh, five, six years before we actually uh, found an opportunity to um, uh, really work together. And I think that was uh, in 2020 as uh, uh, COVID hit and uh, there started being uh, the ways of working in esports really changed uh, in a good way, in a bad way, depending on uh, how you look at it. And I think that opened up an opportunity to uh, really put the two companies together. We uh, worked a little bit on it uh, in 2020. In 2021, we decided uh, on both sides, it made sense to uh, merge the two companies and uh, uh, pursue uh, going public together, uh, which uh, uh, never happened. We worked together for a year uh, before uh, we actually got uh, the offer to join uh, Savis and Davor, and uh, that's, uh, well, the rest is history. Craig, could you maybe unpack the history a bit more too? Because I know um, you were at ESL, uh, which was part of uh, Modern Times Group, ended up merging with DreamHack. Could you maybe walk through your side of, of how this came to be um, and, and up till you know, yeah. merging with Faceit as well? Yeah, so similar as Nick described, right? Known each other for a long time. I mean, I think that basis of fam- or that familiarity is the basis of, I think, the trust that ultimately brought us together through the, the mutual respect and admiration of our organizations. Uh, but as Nick was describing, you know, aside from, let's say, the years of talking to one another, saying, how can we work together, covid uh, on the ESL side, I think was really the impetus for it. Uh, recognizing, like most companies, you had to suddenly, be, you know, become more digital. Uh, the importance of the relationship with consumers and rethinking how you did things. Uh, so, simply having massive esports events with arenas full of people and tens of millions of people watching was great. We actually needed to strengthen our relationship with our consumer uh, and the digital platform of what Face It offers of really being. Uh, that, that home for those players, playing games, connecting with one another became um, really important. And then similarly, we recognized the opportunity to get closer to game developers and publishers uh, through that. Uh, and that if we're able to actually help power their core business of multiplayer play, um, that on top of an esports relationship, we're actually adding a lot of value to them and what face its technology is allowing us to really do that. So uh, as Nick described in September of 2020, is sort of I think when we resume talking, uh, some heated rounds of negotiations, um, and when we all kind of figured out, let's say, the strategy and really got into it of how much it made sense, it probably took us another seven months then to figure out the how. And exactly as you described, Darren, ESL part of Modern Times Group, uh, I think wasn't that attractive for uh, Nicolo and the Face It team to, to join up with. Uh, and so we started to look at alternative ways together with MTG that says, how could we spin ESL out 
and and merge together with face it to create this new business um so that's as nick described sort of a process that we were under to potentially go public through that we got to meet the savvy team the savvy games team um and through that as nick said sort of the rest is history but i think you know interesting a little bit to the correction let's say in your introduction uh, the merger of ENL, of esl and face it uh was i'd say the brainchild of the management and our shareholders uh, or the support of our shareholders it wasn't savvy coming and figuring out how do you put these two companies together we we're on a track to do it based off an extensive relationship together um and obviously savvy being a, a great enabler to our vision made a lot of sense Cool. And I didn't mean to imply Savvy was was the brains, but that is a is a good correction and note to make. That's, what, that's why we're on the podcast now. Exactly. That's what we're here for. <laughs> uh, well, I guess on to that, um, could, maybe this is a good time to kind of talk about why Savvy was the right partner, you know, at the the time to kind of unlock, um, you know, that upside and merger possibility for you both. Could you maybe just talk a bit more about why why Savvy? Uh, was the right choice, and I guess since you you've been operating under them for a while, just you know, quick quick notes on how that's been so far. With any partnership, especially in business, right, it's about people, uh, and I think first and foremost, we had the opportunity to get to know the people that were working on Savvy for quite some time, uh, even prior to their formal formal announcement. So we had an understanding of what the vision and ambition was of Savvy even prior to the announcement. And I think what was really compelling uh, for us all together was the opportunity to have a long-term sh- a shareholder with a long-term investment horizon. Being part of MTG, we were sort of let's say beholden to quarterly earnings. Uh, obviously, you know, venture funds you know have certain profiles of, of investment and so forth. Um, but Savvy being part of PIF, um, having a seven to ten-year investment horizon. We thought was incredible or was really attractive to us to really enable our vision and knowing how nascent the esports industry is and how dynamic the video game industry is and having the opportunity to impact as you describe in your introduction sort of um some some big influence was super compelling to us um so i think you know for savvy from my perspective it was about people the belief in it the understanding the long-term support and also the um, foresight, I would say, of what we have, of how you've seen MENA as a region coming online into the global video game business. You know, 20 years ago, it was all about China. 10 years ago, it was emerging markets like Brazil. And I think what you've seen of the demographics uh, of the region here, it's starting to play an increasingly important role uh, for different game publishers. So again, being closer into that region, I think also gives us unique insight uh, and opportunities to to grow and develop our business. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and we can talk more about that alongside your your company strategy and views for the future in a moment. But first, I, I do want to take some time to talk about your view of the state of esports um, because you know you know many have called this recent era of esports unsustainable. And clearly, you know, with examples like the delisting of phase group, shutting down the Overwatch League, valuation resets across the board. There is something um, to the concerns out there. But I am curious about your uh, your view on the industry's sustainability and its evolution um, right now. And, and I suppose uh, EFG's uh, position in all of that change. Uh, Nick, I'll start with you uh, if you want to share your thoughts. Sure. I think that connects a little bit to uh, the previous question as well, like uh, why Savvy is the right partner. I think it really gave us the opportunity to navigate all of this, uh, looking at it as an opportunity uh, and uh, with a very long-term lens, uh, rather than uh, having to go through quarterly earnings calls and uh, having to explain short-term profitability. And that's something that we were sort of, uh, I don't want to say expecting, but... uh, uh, I think we knowing the industry and where esports is in its, uh, let's say, life cycle. Uh, I think that's what uh, the industry needs. We need uh, there is a need for long term capital. There is uh, a need for investments rather than uh, rushed uh, uh, decisions in order to maximize uh, uh, short term gains. And that's roughly what we did. Uh, I think what you're seeing today uh, is not necessarily uh, a, a full reset, but it's definitely a normalization 
of links and uh, it also uh, ends up showing the, um, the need you have in the industry for a stable partner that can uh, uh, really deliver a full ecosystem that uh, is not only shiny, but is also sustainable. And uh, that's what uh, we do as uh, uh, ESL face it ultimately. Yeah, I fully agree. And I think even though there's been, let's call it headlines of some of the challenges that you described, Aaron, I think what uh, continues to give us the confidence and conviction is that the underlying KPIs behind the industry uh, and the audience are there, right? We have increasing viewership, increasing attendance, increasing player player usage. Um, so what that tells us is that video games is an entertainment medium and esports is probably the strongest manifestation of community um, is healthy. And I think this period of correction that we're sort of describing, uh, as Nick said, is, is super healthy. I think it's long overdue. And I think specifically when you think about esports separate from video games, Esports is about fandom, and fandom takes time. In traditional sports, fandom has taken generations and centuries uh, to really develop. And I think there was an influx of investment money uh, with different technology-based venture horizons, let's call it, that thought they could incubate and accelerate it. Um, but as Nick described, this is still very early in where it's going and being able to shape this in a stable partner uh, we think is going to create a, a better position for the industry through the other side. So there'll be some short-term pain as things get sort of figured out and cycled through, but we're more confident than ever in our position uh, and ability to navigate and be a partner for the entire ecosystem through this. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, esports has followed the hype cycle uh, to to the T, like many emerging technologies and industries do as well. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, what the the path is uh, to kind of lead us to the other side. Um, in the past couple of months, we've had two other um, esports leaders on the podcast. We had Nicole Lapointe Jameson, who uh, well, who was CEO of Evil Geniuses when we recorded, and uh, also John Robinson, who is president and COO of One Hundred Thieves. And we asked them both one question, which was, "If you could change one thing about the current space of esports to make your life easier, what would it be?" And Nicole's answer was media rights. And John answered that perhaps we should change the underlying structure of like who runs and manages esports because the incentives um, aren't always entirely aligned when publishers run the, the full esports show. And he actually praised some of what you guys do in his answer. But um, and I want to ask you the same question in a moment. But, but first, I, I'm Curious, maybe maybe uh, uh, Craig, you can lead on this one. What is the benefit or trade off of how ESL DreamHack or are structured compared to esports being run by publishers, usually in a franchise model? Yeah, I think as as ESL Face a Group, what's super unique about us is this global infrastructure that we've set up around the world, uh, both in the physical and the digital sense of this. Uh, and when you think whether that's running competitions, whether that's standalone events like IEM filling arenas around the world, whether that's DreamHack festivals where you feature different esports content coming together, or it's face it where the community is coming together and logging in and sharing and connecting with like-minded players, um, that ultimately is the audience or that's the activation platform that we believe any game in any community can be a part of. So I think that the benefit that we've offered publishers in particular is the flexibility to come quickly into our universe, to scale up, to scale down, to hit certain regions of the world uh, based off where it is. And ultimately, um, what Nicole and John were hitting on is monetization. And uh, what that comes back to ultimately is about having the right audience at scale. And what we've seen is that what we know is that scale matters. I think that's the challenge of an individual team. I think that's the challenge in many ways of an individual game or community that a publisher hosts esports for. But being able to build long-term partnerships uh, with publishers, with players and teams that allow us to share in the economics when we could go to market with a highly attractive audience at scale is what's going to accelerate the industry forward. Do you think there's also something to the economics side of it where you know if publishers are fully running esports um there's more of you know less of an incentive to you know make a profitable environment for that esport 
for it and more of an incentive um, for it to kind of be more of a marketing vehicle. And, you know, th- through that lens, you know, it just has ripple effects on all the participants in the ecosystem in a, in a way that's different from how, you know, you guys coming in, um, you know, creating more of that esports ecosystem, um, you know, kind of from the ground up to ensure that all the participants on all sides, um, including yourself, win in some way. Is there, is there something to like the economics side of that that's yeah. relevant here too? I think there's two things you have to remember. I think one for publishers, esports is the how. The why and the what is engagement, retention, and monetization. So what we know is that esports creates a more engaged audience than non-competitive players. We create content that keeps the community involved into those games longer. And ultimately, they're spending more time on platform and money in game. So that's why publishers are doing it. Um, and esports is a little bit of the marketing tactic, let's call it in many regards to how. Um, the challenge that you're describing, though, isn't a fault of the publisher. It's about how do you monetize the engagement model of how this audience is participating. And for publishers, it's through microtransactions. And for let's call it the third-party ecosystems of teams and organizers like ourselves, in many ways today, those uh, engagement uh, models are being uh, broken down and redefined versus traditional sports. So as Nicole described, things like media rights, it's because... Uh, right there's a, a business around sports and carriage fees and advertisers that are connecting with the audience in that way. Esports is the tip of the spear of technology and disruption, and I believe broader changes that are happening across a demographic and an audience that esports is just first experiencing that others will. But our ability to take this audience and reimagine how they uh, how we engage with them, how we add value to them, will then create new monetization ways on top of it in the same way that publishers have. Uh, with their gains as a service model. So uh, a little bit of a you know fluffy sort of answer a little bit, but ultimately we've got tons of attention, tons of eyeballs. We need to figure out how to add value to these consumers and to monetize it, whether it's in a direct-to-consumer model, whether it's a B2B to C model, or whether it's through advertising, you know, uh, you know, that drives media rights. So those are the chapters I think of esports that now with some of the frothiness behind us. I think it's bringing together stakeholders in the right way to sit around the same side of the table and says, as Nick described, how do we build something sustainable and share in that uh, in a healthy way? Yeah, that's a really interesting answer. And I want to go ahead and actually ask you <laughs> the same question that I asked them. And um, Nick, I'll start, I'll start with you. Uh, if you could change one thing about the current state of esports to you know, make your life easier or to even make it more sustainable, what would it be? I think sustainability is the key question here. Uh, Everything we just talked about and uh, the correction that is happening, none of this would have happened if everybody would have focused on taking decisions that were aimed at the sustainability of the ecosystem they were building. So I think uh, if there is one thing I change is uh, to make sure that every stakeholder starts thinking about uh, long-term partnerships and uh, Uh, about the long-term impact of the decisions we take on the ecosystem that we're building and really start thinking about an ecosystem uh, around the games uh, and uh, the teams uh, and uh, uh, the competitions that we're building. Craig, what would be your answer? I think we spent too much time together as (laughs) co-CEOs. I'd I'd give the same. I'd call it stakeholder alignment, exactly as Nick described. Um, Right, There's lots of value. There's lots of opportunity. But if we don't work together... Uh, and everyone share and participate and add value in the right way, um, then you're competing with each other over what the pie is today versus what it's going to grow to. Uh, and that's going to hold back some of the innovation that we were just speaking to moments before. So uh, figure out how to work together in a more long-term, uh, let's say, more holistic approach to the ecosystem, as Nick described, is spot on. Okay. Gotcha. Glad glad you're both aligned on, the, on that answer then. And we can spend a bit more time um, later in the episode talking about uh, the future, what what you're thinking about for your own organization and how that could play into to some of this industry-wide as well. Um, but before I do that, um, one thing I'm curious about more looking backwards is the impact of, of COVID. Obviously, it, it came in like a wrecking ball for, for the events side of, of esports. Um, really propelled the industry to turn digital in a lot of ways and 
and you were at the forefront of figuring all of this out and adapting throughout the chaos in, in real time. Um, but Craig, I am, I'm curious to, to hear from the event side of things. How do esports events today compare to pre-COVID times? Like, are we back to normal? Is there a new normal because things are different and more digital now? How would you compare today to, to two, three years ago? Feels like an eternity ago and so much has changed. Uh, I think what we've seen is that the thirst for live events and live experience across all of entertainment is arguably stronger than what it's been before. Um, so I think that's been um, you know, a, a net impact, let's say, through that. Um, that being said, there were opportunities to look at some of the uh, or through the period of COVID where you had to rethink how you did and why you did everything. There were opportunities to take best practices forward. Uh, so for us, we've, you know, figured out new ways to create uh, different types of competitions. Uh, so something like Dream League is an example as a predominantly online season of play with the top Dota teams in the world versus in ESL one where, you know, filling out an arena uh, with, you know, 10,000 fans and all the best players there. But to, as Nick described, creating an ecosystem for Dota now that blends both the online play that has a little bit more sustainability, I think, from a player perspective and the live excitement that comes for fans and players ultimately competing in those biggest stages, I think creates a more balanced product uh, as part of that for, for, for the players and fans of those titles. So I think there were, let's call them competitive um, learnings that we took from it. Certainly from a workflow perspective, remote broadcast, things like that have changed it. Even traditional sports and enter or traditional television, you see now that before every show always had every on-air talent in the studio. Uh, now you see much more commonly like podcasts that we have today where it's people joining in remotely because home technology has gotten so good internet speeds cameras um, that you could achieve a similar kind of effect without, let's say, all the in-studio costs that come with that. So I think there's been the blend across that from a pure esports perspective of competitions and how you do things um, that I think are some of the lasting benefits to it. Um, but there's no substitute for the face-to-face. -face. Uh, there's no substitute from a player perspective of being, you know, your heart pulsing and racing in front of 10,000 people uh, either cheering for or against you. And that's at the heart of competition. Nick, how about the, the face it side of things? How did COVID change the way that you think about running face it as a business or the way that just people naturally started engaging with it. Yeah, I think you, um, I mean, you mentioned it uh, on the digital side, obviously uh, it was uh, easier to manage than on the physical <laughs> side, uh, at least right. in the short, uh, in the short one. Uh, we uh, basically started uh, seeing our growth rates increasing significantly overnight. Uh, and uh, under a management perspective, what was most painful was to scale uh, as quickly as uh, our user base, uh, which uh, was was challenging uh, in any case. But I think what uh, uh, changed the most uh, is uh, in terms of uh, what we got as an inheritance of COVID in a certain sense is the way we work as an organization, which um, I think is extremely interesting. Uh, and this goes uh, across uh, different types of businesses. Uh, we now, now find, find ourselves with... Uh, offices all over the world and uh, employees working in teams that are global and uh, that are used to uh, a flexible work environment, that are used to uh, work in a way that under a communication point of view is uh, um, uh, remote and uh, um, finding the right structure, I think, is the challenge of the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. And this uh, affects, uh, uh, I think, any business that went for COVID. Interesting. Uh, well, maybe we can talk uh, about this a bit more towards the end of the episode in terms of how you are both you know, integrating or have integrated your teams together, our position globally, remotely, and how, how you manage um, the chaos of, of all of that. Um, but before we do that, I do want to talk maybe a bit more broadly about your, your company strategy, a bit more about the savvy piece of the puzzle here too. Um, and so maybe, maybe to, to kind of kickstart this side of the conversation, um, in terms of what ESL Facent currently does, 
what are your largest opportunities for the future? And this might be a good opportunity to also just unpack a bit more specifically what you do, like what are your sub brands, and then kind of build on top of that um, to to kind of hit on specifically, like based on all of the things that you already already do. Uh, what are you most excited about in terms of pushing the business forward, Craig? I'll I'll start with you. Sure. I think uh, what's super interesting is EFG is we're not ESL, we're not DreamHack, we're not FaceIt, we're not DreamHack Sports, we're not Vindex, we're not Esports Engine. Uh, we're one company as ESL FaceIt Group or EFG. And with that, I think we've been able to create a really exciting vision uh, for the company that's all about doing something different. It's about building worlds beyond gameplay where players and fans become community. Um, so I think as ESL previously... Uh, we're very esports focused, but now with the power of the merger and the combination, we have the opportunity to be more, uh, more things to more players, more things to more fans, more things to different types of communities. Um, so our opportunity ahead of us is to become more than an esports company. Uh, I think that stakeholder alignment that's going to drive the esports industry is underway. Uh, I would say the opportunity or the uh, uh, ability to aggregate and scale audiences, I think, is underway. Uh, and now for us, I think it's about how do we take that next chapter for for ourselves and think about communities coming together in different ways and the kinds of digital and physical experiences that really keep them going. Um, so each of our different brands, ESL, FaceIt, DreamHack, and so forth, I think all have a very specific role within that strategy of branching out beyond esports and to ultimately uh, be a, a nexus uh, or a connector um, for the, for the community altogether. Gotcha. Nick, maybe you can unpack this a little bit from your point of view as well. Um, obviously, saying that, you know, the future is going to be very different from the past in terms of what you're building. That's that's a, that's a pretty big thought. And if you look at just, you know, previously, face it individually, or just, you know, ESL and DreamHack individually, um, it's sort of hard to see, you know, either of those pieces individually being able to make that kind of leap. But together, where you combine different types of audiences, more than one type of end product, the synergies, I guess, start to make more sense and the building blocks maybe become easier to build on top of. Could you, you know, just talk a bit more about those synergies and what that means going into building something new in the future? Sure. And I think that's uh, connected to uh, what Craig said. We, we see it as one company now because, uh, as you said, like... Uh, on a standalone basis, uh, we would not probably not be able to do uh, and see what we're seeing today, uh, and the opportunity would be different. I think the opportunity we have today is really uh, around uh, uh, creating something completely new and this uh, beyond uh, uh, play strategy that we put together. Uh, I think when it comes to embed something that is possible thanks to the combination of these businesses, and let's not forget about uh, uh, Vindex and uh, uh, Esports Engine too, uh, who joined the family uh, recently. Um, I think when it comes to the uh, synergies, ultimately the merge and everything we've done since is uh, focused on one thing, which is creating more value for our stakeholders, whether it's uh, uh, game publishers and game developers, whether it's brands uh, and or our players. It's uh, uh, really all around that. Uh, I think uh, uh, Craig mentioned uh, monetization, engagement, uh, and uh, acquisition being drivers for most of our B2B clients. That's what we focus on with the different parts of our products. So whether it's uh, uh, creating a, the best esports ecosystem around the game and uh, um, or sending that same audience towards one of our digital products and retaining that audience that we then send back to uh, events whenever we're live, that's a good example of a synergy, and it's a good example of something we do in order to maximize the value we can create for our partners. Uh, if you think about our players uh, and uh, and our viewers, ultimately it's the same segment. So it's uh, really about uniting a user flow and uh, uh, looking at it uh, holistically, not just uh, for that short amount of time during which one of our specific products engages with them, I think that opens a Pandora's box when it comes to opportunities that we can start looking at under a data perspective to better understand that audience and ultimately also to better understand the ROI of specific initiatives, which, again, most of our partners would not be able to do 
without working with us and without this company basically being one. Uh, I think these are many different <laughs> examples of uh, uh, how uh, we can work together. I think ultimately all of this together gives us the opportunity of uh, start thinking of not just uh, esports, but as Greg was saying, uh, of uh, everything that uh, uh, lives around the game that we call Beyond Gameplay. Awesome. Well, this conversation has been super interesting so far, especially hearing about how, you know, once you both have merged together, how your vision for yourselves in the future has, has also grown too. And one interesting note here is the comments about um, expanding beyond play. Nick, could you ex explain a bit, maybe help ground it for us? What does that really mean for you as an organization? And what are you aiming to, to build or achieve there in the coming years? Sure. sure. Uh, when it comes to uh, beyond play, the way we look at uh, the industry in general is uh, that the community around games is uh, what has been uh, really a growth pattern uh, in the industry. It's something that uh, changed the way we play video games already. Uh, and it's a constantly growing aspect of gaming. And uh, uh, that's uh, uh, something that... Uh, we target as beyond play. The community tends to live outside the 20 minutes during which they have a game session. They start uh, interacting outside the game. They start organizing outside the game. That's what we call beyond play. And that's why we say that's where players and fans become community. And that's what we want to uh, really focus on as uh, a company. We believe that uh, esports and competition is uh, uh, the most feasible aspect of uh, uh, these communities beyond play, but it's not limited to that. And what we're doing is looking at different ways that we can engage with all of these different communities, starting from competition in esports, but uh, as uh, uh, as we said, going beyond that. Um, let me double click into that. One thing that I'm I'm curious to ask is um, how you um, kind of pull off new products, new experiences, and make them successful across your entire audience? Because I imagine, um, at least currently, how some of your audience views itself as they're less members of EFG and they're more, you know, a user of Faceit or they enjoy DreamHack events or ESL events. Um, when it comes to kind of spinning up new things and expanding your vision of what you do, but also how they, all of these users engage with you, how do you bridge all of these brands and experiences together? I think we started creating more and more bridges. We started with uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, initiatives. And I'll give an example of something that uh, uh, went live uh, uh, super quick. I think just in a few weeks uh, uh, post-merger, uh, we were basically featuring IEM inside the FACI client, making sure that uh, uh, players that were interested in uh, watching one of the streams uh, uh, had it uh, visible and were reminded of it. Now, this is a, a very small example of uh, uh, something that starts connecting those experiences. I think we went beyond that and uh, over the last uh, few months uh, started doing more and more of these integrations, whether it's uh, a Faceit proof or a Faceit experience within um, IEM Rio or IEM Kern uh, to having uh, the uh, ESEA experiences on Faceit and uh, uh, similar sort of things. So I think there are many different opportunities to start connecting the products because ultimately a very relevant subset of the overall population using our, our each of our products is a common subset and is a common segment that tends to use all of them. And uh, that's something that we keep studying and keep doing. Uh, Faceit drops uh, during a broadcast uh, I mean, I, I think we, we have probably over 100 different examples. Uh, and as you said, you're right. It's different products that uh, interact with each other. And what we try to do is maximize value for, among others, the consumer when they use them. Yeah, and I think as Nick described earlier, I think that's also where data becomes such a key important. So understanding who our users are across our different family of brands, whether you're coming to a DreamHack event or logging on with friends and face it. Uh, having that unique identifier that uh, unifies that identity and of how you're experiencing our company uh, is super important. And then the data of understanding those consumer habits beyond it. So 
Um, I think that's the, the unique identifier, let's say, to all of this, as Nick described, the um, oceans of information that we think are available to us as a business. Is there anything else about the be operating under Savvy that better unlocks this opportunity for you? Obviously, being able to work together as ESL Face It and other companies together under one operating group um, helps build your scale, enables synergies to exist. And you you mentioned earlier in the episode how Savvy, you know, provides a long term. Um, you know, way of thinking, so you don't have to obsess over quarterly earnings or or anything like that. Is there anything else that, by operating under Savvy, it unlocks for you to be able to, you know, help make these these goals and aspirations reality? Yeah, I think you touched a little bit on this in the intro, Aaron, which is right, recognizing also the breadth of investments that exist. Uh, through Savvy and PIF into uh, the largest video game companies in the world. Uh, I think increasingly as the industry, video game industry had faced headwinds over call the last 12 months, the credibility that we've had as EFG, uh, I think, was um, further recognized, I would say, as a stable partner for these companies uh, through that in large part because of being part of Savvy and also in many cases, large or largest shareholders into companies like EA and Activision and um, Capcom and and at right Nintendo and and on across the board of what they, it is. So, um, you know, I, I think that's also is just the beginning, I would say, of the opportunities that we have uh, to build more meaningful relationships as a more integrated partner uh, across uh, some of the largest IP in the world, uh, as well as to house of where the next generation of hits are going to be coming from. This is uh, perhaps a tangent, but um, you know, everyone paying attention knows that Saudi Arabia has invested many billions of dollars into sports more generally, um, you know, such as soccer slash football, golf, et cetera, really, you know, upending uh, the landscapes for some of these more traditional sports. Is there any parallel to the view on esports here from the Saudi Arabia point of view that you're you're operating under? I think really for you know it's uh, the belief and the conviction that esports is the future of the, the digital the sport of the digital generation uh, and video games is a, an attractive investment industry on top of that. So um, you know I think it's all about relevance and relevance drives revenue. Uh, and this is clearly where an entire generation is spending their time as they're experiencing uh, from ground zero within the um, within the country themselves. Gotcha. Uh, well, before we move on, uh, just to kind of wrap up the savvy um, piece of this conversation, I'm curious to to also briefly hear your thoughts on the broader savvy games strategy. Is there anything else beyond ESL face it um, within savvy or you know in its future? Uh, that excites you, or maybe that you think the industry at large underestimates or doesn't quite see? Yeah, I, I think when it comes to the uh, strategy, I think uh, it's uh, and, and the benefits for us, as Craig was saying, like we're talking about a group that aims at being uh, the, they are one of the largest uh, video games companies in the world, and uh, uh, ultimately looking and understanding at. Uh, uh, video gaming is uh, a broader form of entertainment, also including esports. So if, if you look at it, it's uh, the perfect fit for us. And uh, uh, the question for me is not uh, uh, if this is going to happen. It's a question of uh, when is this going to happen. And some might claim that uh, following the scope of the acquisition, we're uh, already on a, a very good path uh, to becoming that. Uh, which uh, I think is extremely exciting, and uh, we're very, very glad we're a part of it. All right. <laughs> well, let's go ahead um, and and move on. Um, I want to talk about the lessons in leadership, what you've learned working together um, and as part of managing change and such. But uh, I guess before I do that, one last question: um, Could you tell me about GG for All? Uh, what's the goal there? What are you trying? Um, to, to unlock as part of um, that project? Yeah, so we launched GG for All, um, gosh, it was uh, 2021 or so. Or so. Uh, and for us, it's all about, uh, you know, to be a leader, you have to act like a leader. And for us, it's really trying to drive a more equitable experience uh, and, and, and responsibility across the industry. 
so for us, whether that's things like integrity and fair play, whether it's things like, uh, you know, carbon neutral and the effect on the planet of what we have, uh, or whether it's creating a safe environment for players of different genders and backgrounds to come together and compete. Uh, I think within GG for all programs like ESL Impact and what we've been able to do in Women's Counter-Strike has been awesome to see and awesome to see also how the fan base is attached to that. And whether that's at DreamHack events, it's, you know, literally standing room overflowing crowds, whether it's the viewership numbers that we've seen exceed that of other traditional male-based esports competitions. I think it should, continues to show that when you create a safe environment for people, and you give them the platform to express themselves and to just showcase what they're capable of, um, that there's a lot of potential out there. Uh, so GG for all is something that we've been, um, I think, excited to, to pioneer um, and still very early also in, in where it's all going. Great. Uh, well, before we, we hit on the leadership points to, to wrap us up, is there anything else about the the future of EFG that you want to to highlight or make our audience aware of where you're heading that might be different from where you are now? I think maybe one thing is just, you know, how much has happened in so little of time. I think that's something (laughs) that I continue to pinch myself on and remind myself of, of, you know, the ESL face it merger has only officially been done, you know, in April of last year. So 16 months or so into that. Um, And the effort to build one company, one culture, a new vision out of that, um, to get the business working operationally, to get the products developed against this new joint roadmap. Um, this is going to be a very long game and we're still in a very early inning of it all. So I think it's easy to get lost in where it is now um, and more important to think about still where our company and the entire industry is going in three years, five years, 10 years, 30 years um, is what excites me uh, an incredible amount. I totally agree with Craig. I think uh, if, if you look at it, uh, we're at the beginning of a journey and uh, what's ahead is extremely exciting. And what I'm extremely excited about is the many different ways that we can uh, increase the value we create for the stakeholders. If I look at it, I think we already uh, improved it quite a bit uh, in the last uh, 16 months. And uh, uh, for any of these stakeholders working with us, uh, comes with uh, a serious advantage. Uh, and uh, ultimately, if I look at all of, all of the opportunities we talked about, uh, it's uh, we, we can go well beyond that. So Awesome. Uh, well, I have to know, what is it like operating under a co-CEO structure? Um, any tips on how to make it work well? What have you learned? How do you, you know, resolve any disagreements? Uh, would just love to to kind of hear your general thoughts on how you both make this work. Nick, I'll start with you. Uh, Aaron, do you have a family member you really dislike? <laughs> For the sake of this going public, I'm going to say no. <laughs> Jokes aside, I think it's, um, for me, it's a new one. Uh, I think it has its uh, uh, pros and cons, and uh, ultimately, it's uh, uh, something that can add a lot of value. Uh, if uh, you do it with the right person uh, and uh, uh, Craig, don't get too excited. Uh, But um, uh, ultimately, if you have the right person and uh, uh, next to you and uh, uh, it's uh, someone with whom you're compatible with uh, or you end up, uh, it it ends up creating a synergy. Takes a a lot off your table uh, because you can count on someone that uh, uh, sees things at your same level and uh, at the same time has uh, a very complementary point of view. Uh, I think the CEO's job is an extremely uh, lonely job, uh, at least in my experience, uh, probably the most lonely I've ever been. And having someone to share that loneliness with <laughs> is uh, is pretty cool. Yeah, f- yeah, fully agree. And as Nick said, I think it's about compatibility, right? And that mutual respect. And I think we've been fortunate in that our relationship was forged over a longer period of time, as Nick ta- told the story of how we'd met, right? So that familiarity, the understanding that as we were getting into this adventure together, that we'd already seen the world so similarly and shared such a common vision uh, on the business, on the culture, on the organization of where we wanted to go. Um, and like any relationship uh, in life, it's about compromise and, and being able to work together. Um, and I I feel in a positive way, we've been so aligned. There's been very few points of compromise 
Uh, and when it is, it's, you know, the little things, right? Whether you want the, the wall painted in, you know, fixed stripes or little stripes, doesn't matter. The room's going to look great. Um, and uh, I've been fortunate being able to, to get to know Nick, as he's described as well, uh, over this period of time. And I think to his point, it's allowed a more complementary skill set that has, I think, uh, benefited ourselves and the organization. Great. Well, you also together and separately have experienced a long string of changes, COVID, mergers, acquisitions, you know, new teammates, changing priorities. Um, I'm really curious to know what you learned about integrating um, your organizations and even other organizations together and leading them through times of change. Craig, I'll start with with you on this one. I know you've seen a bunch of this on the ESL side <laughs> over the years. Yeah, it's uh, laughing to myself as you talk about all that change that has happened and all of that, those called unsettling right kind of moments. Uh, and I was just thinking it's all been sort of in the last three and a half years. So it feels like the constant thing in this period of time is, is change. Uh, but to your question, I think what I've learned through this is that uh, ultimately everything's about people. Uh, it's about understanding their point of view and whether it's you know going into integration and making sure that you're people centric or doing the work uh, to understand what motivates people. Um, ultimately, it's our responsibility and opportunity as leaders to inspire those that we work with, um, but to do it in a context that gives them a great sense of pride of uh, not just being part of something great, but also being a valued piece of that journey. Um, and I think uh, over the last three years, it's reminded that being able to connect with individuals and inspire them and understand them uh, has been key to building an organization that's been able to take a business uh, through so much of that change and come out on the other side with momentum. Right. Finance, strategy, all of that stuff matters. But at the end of the day, companies really at their very core are are people. And, and Nick, obviously, um, you know, alongside people and, and integrating priorities comes integrating cultures. And, and you specifically have, you know, went from a, a smaller team to now working and leading a much larger team in a very short period of time. What have you learned about, you know, integrating cultures together? But also, what have you learned um, about the differences and how you've grown as a leader to, you know, serve different types and size teams? I think it's uh, the, the cultural topic is a super interesting one. As uh, Craig said, ultimately it's people, and uh, uh, people first uh, means that uh, you need to uh, take into account uh, how do you lead people and how do you make them feel part of something that is uh, uh, exciting and they want to be a part of. Uh, that's probably the biggest difference between what uh, you can find on paper and what makes sense on paper and what ends up not working or working in reality. And uh, culture is ultimately a mean to that. It's uh, how do we work together, what we all believe in, and uh, uh, it's something that is extremely important. I think um, before going into the uh, experience of the ESL basic merger, I had seen it happening uh, in my youth when I was at uh, Lehman. Uh, Lehman Brothers went, went bankrupt, and within uh, a couple of weeks got acquired from separate entities. The, European side was acquired from Nomura, Japanese bank. Completely different culture. And uh, ultimately, what I saw from the inside and what I suffered was uh, uh, the toy breaking and uh, uh, people really changing overnight, uh, which is something that uh, I think uh, and I hope uh, uh, I may treasure off as an experience. Uh, so I think going into the uh, ESL Face It merger, we really looked at uh, uh, how could we. Uh, really work on culture, putting people first from day one and making sure that everyone would feel part of the process to uh, get to a culture that was optimal for the company. So I think uh, the, the whole experience was uh, amazing. I think I'm extremely proud of what we built in terms of uh, culture for EFG. Again, I think it's only the uh, stepping stone and uh, there is uh, uh, plenty of work to do. As uh, uh, Craig knows, I'm... Uh, uh, fixated about uh, keep work, uh, keeping our uh, work on it uh, and keep uh, progressing on it, uh, but very, very proud about what we've built so far. Awesome. And final question about this. I'm, I'm curious, um, 
what you both have done to to grow and improve as leaders amongst all of this change. Maybe it's, you know, books you read or habits you formed or, you know, a coach you got. I don't know. Um, but I'm just curious how you both have gone about improving as as leaders. Craig, any anything from your end? Oh, there's a lot here. Uh, I think for me, it's uh, being a better listener. Uh, and trying to really understand and listen and uh, where people are coming from, how things are perceived uh, kind of through that. So, um, yeah, I think that's super important, especially in such a dynamic industry that with so much change with different cultures and companies and businesses coming together. Uh, it's been um, exciting for me. I, I second that uh, with uh, being a listener while at the same time, being able in all of that chaos and with all of that input to keep firm on a direction without uh, going uh, up and down too much. And that's probably the one thing that uh, um, uh, I and I think we in general keep uh, uh, fighting with in a certain sense is uh, how much change in the direction is too much. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's hard when you get inputs uh, throwing you all over a place, especially in a uh, fast-changing industry like gaming. Uh, it's something that sometimes can be hard. I think the other thing under personal point of view, and I'm not the right one, right person to talk about it, but stability. Uh, I tend to be, if I look at, at the past 10 years of my life, something I wish I would have found earlier was a little bit more stability and less uh, extremes, whether it's uh, how much you work, how much you uh, uh, end up uh, uh, putting into uh, building the company and so on. Uh, I think uh, having that stability actually allows you to uh, have a very different point of view and uh, be with pressure. So uh, at, at times, uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, having more stability, both as a manager and as a person, most importantly, is uh, something that uh, helps a lot. Awesome. Well, those are both really, really compelling answers, and I'll be be thinking about those myself. Uh, well, we do need to start wrapping up, but a couple of very quick final questions. We talked a lot about esports today. We talked a lot about EFG. Your, you know, how you're thinking about the future, what you've learned from the past. Um, but I just want to take a moment. Is there anything else in the games industry that you're particularly excited about right now? It could be a game, maybe a company, maybe an emerging trend. Beyond your your day to day of thinking about esports, what else is exciting you out there, Nick? I'll start with you on this one. <laughs> you always manage to start with the one person <laughs> that says, uh, "Please go ahead to the other one." Uh, I think. Uh, look, personally, uh, we have so much excitement within uh, uh, esports and the worlds of communities. I think, uh, especially given everything that is happening. Uh, that uh, what uh, really excites me today is our ability to uh, be the glue between different stakeholders in the industry and uh, for once to finally align everyone's interest to make sure that the ecosystem we're talking about and what we're talking about is not uh, uh, dividing a small pie and a small ecosystem, but what we're talking about is really how to grow an ecosystem that. Uh, can become the largest sports in the world. And uh, that, that's what excites me today. Uh, personally, I like Forex games. So I'm uh, looking forward to new Forex games coming out. But uh, uh, I think it's way more exciting to talk about uh, uh, esports and uh, what we, we can do out of it. I think it's super exciting to see how communities are coming together and how video games are woven into people's lives beyond the time they place what they spend playing them friends they make, the relationships they build, watching content, going to events, being part of communities, you just see how much more pervasive this is. Um, and I think that's one of the things I find super exciting. And as Nick described, the big opportunity to hopefully for EFG to be the glue uh, that can stitch it together across the board there inside and out of game and across these different pieces of it. So um, from an industry perspective or a community perspective, I think that's super exciting. Um, and I think on the industry side, you see there's a lot of excitement around things like Roblox and UEFN and GTA 6, uh, again, of how if these games become platforms for people's times, 
uh, and different experiences get built around that, I think is going to continue to shape a generation in a different way, the same way that social media, gen, you know, shaped the generation before. I think everything has the potential to be turned upside down in many regards um, over the next five or 10 years again. Exciting. Um, and final question from me, if anyone um, from our audience wants to either reach out uh, to you individually or as a company or learn more about what you're up to or how maybe they can get involved um, in, in some way from probably a business side, um, where should they go? How should they reach out? Yeah, I think get on LinkedIn, follow ESL Face Group on there. I think we do a ton of uh, things, posting everything from job interviews to uh, company uh, employee profiles to what's happening across the business and trying to share in, uh, insights across the industry as well. Uh, so for us, I think that's one of our, our biggest platforms to share who we are. I'm going to encourage anyone who's interested in the industry to give us a follow. Amazing. Well, thank you again, Craig and Nick for, for joining me today. This has been a lot of fun. And to all of our listeners, remember to stay tuned for parts two and three of this series in the coming days. And with that, we'll catch you next time. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.